um, there's no way we're getting through both of these things, so I thought we'd spend some time on some buckle power. <laughs> um, I wanted to briefly, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on white mythology, because one of the things in reading white mythology, um, Derrida shows his work in white mythology. Um, by which I mean, it is this kind. Of, it reads much more like, much less like an argument, in the way that structure side of play, even symmetry of any context, is like. Even if you don't get that he's trying to make a point, he's trying. You know that he's trying. You don't get what the point is. You know that he's trying to make a point at some level about Levi Strauss's work and about. Um, whereas this is a much more just like, I'm going to read a series of things that ask questions about what metaphor it is in the context of philosophy and tease out the conceptual dimensions of the relationship between them. Um, so that's what I mean when it's him showing his work. So you've got like just 80 pages of him reading really like four or five different, fairly short um, you know, pieces of philosophy about what a metaphor is and what it isn't. Um, and and the, the, there's a simple, question that, that generates this, which is, if one were going to uh, undertake, um, oh man, i got fantasy football going on, this is my RG3 is starting for me tonight. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'm DVRing it. <laughs> Come on, RG3. That's the guy I play against texting me like, oh, that's fucked up. <laughs> okay. How to return to there from there? Um, so the, the problem is is like okay, is there metaphor in the text of philosophy? Is the question that, that engineers this, and there is a way in which this is just a seventy page extended meditation, seventy page extended meditation on the impossibility of that question, or the complications that are implicit in what seems like a really simple question. Those of you who read Signature Event Context, you remember at the end of page one, again here, page two, he says, I will not say that this one of these meanings of communication is literal and the other one is figurative, because the whole question of problematic of movement from literal to figurative, it's what's in question for communication. Remember that point two on the second page? <laughs> Basically, this essay is an extended working out of that two sentence claim. Um, so how does one, how can one pose, I mean, you know, first of all, to pose the question of are there metaphors in a philosophical text, you would have to begin with a rigorous concept of metaphor. That rigorous concept of metaphor could be taken from Aristotle, could be taken from the Ricoeur, it doesn't really matter, but in some effect it's going to have, it's going to be defined as a distinction between the sensory and the figurative. And that the sensory is more primary and the figurative is secondary or more abstract. Right, so in other words, you've already started doing philosophy. <laughs> right? So the very conception of metaphor is already, already implicates one in the distinction between the sensible and the intelligible which is a classic philosophical dichotomy. So, it's not so easy to ask the question, is metaphor, because you're asking a question of a field of which it's a part. Is there metaphor in the text of philosophy? Well, first you have to determine the concept of metaphor philosophically, A. That's the first step. And then the second step is, and by the way, the concept of philosophy is always metaphorical. It's the reversal. Now, why is that the case? This is where the sun, <coughs> this is where the sun comes into being. And truth. And all of the metaphorics of light and clarity versus darkness and obscurity that fills our notions of what proper thinking should be. In other words, philosophy is already shot through with a, met a solar metaphorics that is not acknowledged. 
Okay, so that's the whole argument of the essay, right? It shows that to you in particular ways, and it also implicates consequences being like the definition of the human as distinct from the animal in places. Um, so the, the desire to hang on to you know, reason around figuration, <coughs> metaphor as a preliminary version of an encounter with truth, because metaphor does provide you with truth, but only by analogy, which is to say there's a detour that one goes through in metaphor. It teaches you something about the thing in question, but only by going away from it. So the ideal is that it goes away from and then returns to the thing, and you have some kind of truth about it. So this is so this the, the, and the catacresis move of uh, of that substitution is constitutive for for him of all thinking. That is to say, philosophy is already metaphorical, and metaphors are already philosophical. without knowing what any of those words mean. <laughs> and then you have this great, I mean, you have the exact same thing as structure sign play at the end of this. Uh, um, on 268, right after he's read a lot of I believe, the, the, the question of the natural light in Descartes. Everything unfolds in light. That's how I know what is true. I can see it. I can see the truth. And the sun becomes the, it, you know, uh, not one figure among others in this regard, because it is the thing that illuminates everything, but that you can't look at. Like the truth. So and then you have, on 268, you have exactly the moves of structure, sign, and play. The end of structure, sign, and play. There are two paths you can go by. There's Team Plato and there's Team Nature. The third full paragraph. This self-destruction always will have been able to take two courses, which are almost tangent and yet different, repeating, binding, and separating each other according to certain laws. One of these courses follow the line of resistance to the dissemination of metaphorical carries with it an irreducible loss of meaning. Let's skip over to the next page. Metaphor, therefore, is determined by philosophy as a provisional loss of meaning, an economy of the proper with, without irreparable damage. It returns to itself. An inevitable detour, but a history with its sights set on the circular reappropriation of meaning. The return to the origin. Right? Or, the second, the other self-destruction thus resembles the philosophical one to the point of being taken for it, this time traversing and doubling through everything that disrupts the blah, 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 consequently to explode, explodes the oppositions between the metaphoric and the proper. It's one of the things he's going to put into question here is the, the function of the proper. So what it means to have a metaphor, like is there a metaphor in the text of philosophy? You'd say, if, if that were the case, you'd say that philosophy was borrowing from economic terms. Right? And so, in other words, terms would have proper homes, and he wants to problematize the function of the proper home, even as well as the question of transport. So this would the metaphoric and the proper, and then if you skip to the very last page, you're like the heliotrope of Plato or Hegel on the one hand, the heliotrope of Nietzsche or Bataille on the other. So it's always Plato or Nietzsche. <laughs> like reading this? I don't really care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, that's something I'm supposed to say, right? Okay, um, so I want to I want to turn to the chapter two of my book then, because what I'm trying to do here is, is lay out a, uh, a rhetoric that is, um, a signifying. Right? I mean, one of the primary attributes of this sense of rhetoric is what I call it's a, a signifying quality. So this is why, <clears throat> and I'll tell you part of the historical reason for my wanting to do this, is Saussurian linguistics becomes the problematic, like I said, for the social sciences, but also for the, for the humanities. And this is, this is the so-called, if you've ever heard this phrase, the linguistic term. Have you heard that phrase? The linguistic term in the humanities? The linguistic turn happened 30 years ago, and that basically is when the concept of Saussurian linguistics invaded the universal problematic. Everyone was talking about signifiers, signified signification, and the of signification. And what one learns from Saussure is that uh, 
signification is structurally indeterminate. We've already got that. There's no transcendental signified at which one stops meaning and arrives at home. One is perpetually moving and perpetually deferred. The field of rhetoric was like, cool, man. We're all over this linguistic term because now we're talking about rhetoric. And why is no one paying attention to that? And my argument here is that this linguistic term has nothing to do with rhetoric. This, the function of signification is an entirely different thing than what rhetoric has been involved in all along. And that what rhetoric has been involved in is prim primarily an asignifying function. So the chapter two of, the, of my books is like, which rhetoric are we talking about? Which rhetoric am I interested in? Obviously I'm writing about invention, so it's the production of the new. But <coughs> the first attribute is, on 17, the attribute of rhetoric is that it's asignified. But what does that mean? You guys read this. What, is a what does it mean here? Absolutely. It's not concerned with communicating some sort of content, but rather causing some sort of effect. Right. That's, it's that simple. Now, what are the effects could be the communication content? That's fine. Um, all right, so here's the usual, the usual diagram of rhetoric is what's called managerial. Managerial rhetoric, and this is, I mean, this is the traditional conception that everyone has, every rhetoric scholar has in their head, which is that somebody goes and figures out what they want to say through some other process, okay? That process could be dialectical if you're, if you're Aristotle, uh, or Plato. Um, it could be scientific. Um, if you're born after the 16th century, it could be religious. You go find your truth through some procedure. Whatever that procedure is, that procedure is extra rhetorical. It is not rhetorical. Okay? Rhetoric then functions as a supplement. Right? Rhetoric comes in after the fact. After you figured out what proposition you want to, you want to advocate, what truth you want to put forward, then rhetoric, uh, then you engage in rhetoric. And the goal of rhetoric then is to be persuasive. Right? So in this sense, <clears throat> rhetoric is historically a supplement not only to the proposition itself, we would say like to the idea, right? we're sort of repeating that diagram to a certain extent. Rhetoric is a supplement uh, not only to the proposition, but to all of the modes of inquiry through which that proposition emerges, philosophy, religion, science, etc. So first things first, even within that traditional diagram, what I want to say is rhetoric is a supplement, sure, but it's a particular kind of supplement. There are different kinds of supplements. And all I've ever said is we've got to pay attention to the difference. So there is, for instance, and, I, and I'm using this word very broadly in the first Derivian sense. Um, there's a supplement to the proposition called communication. Now, what does that supplement try to do? That supplement encounters the idea as an idea, and it endeavors to reproduce as identically as possible <coughs> that idea in somebody else's mind. In other words, I, go, I find out my scientific truth by engaging in scientific methods of inquiry. Like, like that's one thing, right? Um, but let's, for, you know, for our purposes. So I go find that thing out. Now I've got to communicate. And what I'm doing when I communicate is, again, it's a supplementary function but I'm trying to take that idea and give it to you. Yeah. Rhetoric, on the other hand, I'm saying, is asignifying. It's in re in the, that's really not the right word. It's not primarily signifying, because it's not concerned with transmitting an idea from one place to another. It is concerned with giving that idea a force, making it do something. So at its limit, if I persuade you to vote for a particular candidate, you don't even have to know that I've persuaded you to do that at its limit. Now, in many cases, you'll want someone to know what you want them to do, right? But it's not necessary. What I want you to do is the action. I don't, you don't have to understand what the action is or why I want you to do it. You don't have to know any of those things. In most, again, in most cases, you're going to. I'm going to want you to. But you don't have to. 
So the point is, what I'm concerned with when I persuade you is something other than communicating to you. I'm not concerned with getting you to understand an idea. I'm concerned with getting you to act in a certain way. And this is, so, I mean, while people think that this articulation of rhetoric is unusual, to me, this is exactly why Plato, I mean, in antiquity, Plato's whole problem with rhetoric is people are able of acting in accordance with the good without knowing that it's good. That's the problem with rhetoric. Right? And they can they can dissimulate goodness. Um, from a rhetorical perspective, that's all there is. <laughs> is various styles of dissimulating goodness. Right? So, so th that's I mean that's the first difference. Persuasion is not primarily reducible to signification. And again, I also want to point out it's not it's not clearly not an either or. Right? This sense of understanding is obviously often a dimension of persuasion. But it doesn't have to be, is all, that's the only point. In other words, I'm saying there are two different tendencies within this. And so the way that I describe it is, in this tendency, one responds to the proposition, to the claim, uh, men are better than women. That's just the first claim that popped into my head. <laughs> um, one is concerned with transmitting that proposition to your mind so that you understand it. In this place, men are better than women. I want you to believe that. There's a difference there. Right? So what, the way that I'm describing it is one responds to that proposition, in this case, simply as a signifying content, as a meaning, as a thing, to be moved from a place to another place. Right? A signifier to be moved to your consciousness. Whereas in the case of rhetoric, one doesn't respond to that phrase uh, as a content. One responds to it as a constellation of potential forces from which one can extract and do something with it. Make sense? That's, that's the case. This asignifying quality is the case within the most traditional standard version. I mean, there's nothing new and sexy about that. That's what, has always, that's what always confuses me when people are but, but like, that's always been the defining quality of rhetoric as persuasion is that it's concerned with turning, changing, transformation. That's why it's a part of a general tropology. That's why I would say it makes sense if trope is the turning, the figure for persuasion and for metaphor would be the heliotrope, right? The flower that turns towards the sun. That's persuasion, that's metaphor. Did I just lose everyone? Yes. <laughs> okay. In other words, another way of saying this is that for rhetoric, one is concerned not with what the preposition is as a signifying content, but what the proposition does or can do. What its force is. All right, so that's the first attribute of rhetoric that I call attention to. The second one is, and this is, again, still within the diagram, the traditional managerial diagram. Um, the second one is an emphasis on contingency. So it's A signifying, it's contingent. Now the contingency one is not really a question. Right? That's, that's a commonplace. Like, this is, uh, there's no intervention that I'm offering there by saying rhetoric is contingent. So the, the oldest definition, I mean, the most common definition, Aristotle's definition is, uh, the capacity to see the available means of persuasion in any given case, right? Perry Hackathon. And Megan Foley has a pretty interesting version of what that means. It would refute what I'm saying, and she's probably right. But nevertheless, the general understanding of that phrase is to say, there is no general understanding of how rhetoric operates. It matters in each particular case. Meaning what functions as persuasion is going to depend on who your audience is, what the situation is, what their histories are. So there is no general rule for constructing rhetoric. There can be no general rule because rhetoric is an art of contingency and not of universality. It's an art of responding to the particularity of situations. What's that? I just said bricolage. It's bricolage. <laughs> yes, it is bricolage. <laughs> She's writing a book on it right now. Um, 
that in any particular case doesn't refer to particular cases. It, it refers to a kind of absoluteness of contingency. Well, hold on. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, mine is just the commonplace, you know. Um, so, okay, so that's, in, again, this is the traditional image, very com the, the standard version of rhetoric as persuasion. And I'm saying it has these two attributes. It's asignifying and it's contingent. Now, what has happened in the last 30 or so years is that people have not been content with this managerial diagram. People in the field of rhetoric in particular have not been accepting of this idea that there are these other modes of inquiry through which one has to go. We'll say it this way. They're not happy seeing rhetoric as a supplement. They haven't read, read their Derrida, so that they don't really understand the powerful value of supplementarity. Right? We have all, we're like, a supplement, that's where all the cool shit happens. Right? Um, but they're, they're not happy with the image of, uh, of rhetoric as a supplement. And instead, want to see rhetoric as an operation through which the proposition is generated in the first place. So remember, in the tradition, the managerial diagram, right, one does these other practices and comes up with a thesis, a claim, an idea. And then one goes to rhetoric to find out how to make those things persuasive. And I'm saying, even in that diagram, rhetoric is pretty interesting. It's all about contingency, and it's all about a signification. But that is a constrained diagram. And that scholars of the last 30 to 40 years have wanted to expand that diagram and say, hold on a second. That makes rhetoric subservient to all these fields of study. And in fact, isn't rhetoric involved in all of those fields of study? Isn't philosophy concerned with argument? Isn't science concerned with argument? Isn't all those things that claim to be a rhetorical, aren't they actually rhetorical? In other words, is it perhaps the case that rhetoric has never really been a supplement, but has always been constitutive of the forming of the proposition itself? So one has a slew of books written. How much is a slew? Like is seven a slew or 12? 12 is certainly more slewish. Um, a slew of books uh, written that effectively make a claim like this. Practice X always claimed to be a rhetorical, and we're showing that it is, in fact, inundated with rhetoric. So science, I mean, Deidre McClowski made a career on economics is rhetoric. I think that's the title of the book, is <laughs> the rhetoric of economics. And the claim of the book is that economics is rhetorical. Economics, this field that presents itself as a mathematical science, is rhetorical. That there are strategies of persuasion that occur even within this field. So all of those, so, so you've got this, this massive kind of what I would consider like epistemologically oriented um, work whose job is precisely to expand the purview or the scope of rhetoric and rhetorical study such that rhetoric can now be involved in the generation of the proposition and not just in the transmission, the management of the proposition. Now again, one has to be careful about this because it's also the case that it has historically been quite true that most of the people, most of the time, have believed that rhetoric was generative of propositions. Even people that are supposedly antagonistic to rhetoric, like, for instance, Plato, have always acknowledged that certain quite kind of questions, like practical everyday ones, are outside of the scope of true knowledge. They don't lend themselves to the kind of use, universal knowledge that rhetoric is concerned with. They only deal with contextual possibilities. And so this is the classical distinction between between Episteme and Doxa. 
This means knowledge. This means opinion or belief. This is actually a very interesting term, but nevertheless, it's where you get paradox and orthodoxy. Um, so even in uh, a world in which managerial rhetoric reigned, certain types of propositions, doxic ones, were the subject of rhetoric, were produced by rhetoric. In other words, if we're concerned with things that are not universal truths about which knowledge is not possible, like, for instance, should we invade Syria? I mean, this is an example, I mean, obviously it's a contemporary example, although that question was the very same question. And the answer was always, why not? Um, should we invade Syria is a question to which you can't know an answer. You can only have a belief. Right? Because you can't see the future. Okay? So in that terrain, you can draw on knowledge, right? but the content of yes, we should invade, or no, we should, shouldn't invade, is always going to be a doxa. It's always going to be rhetorical. It's always going to be a belief. It's never going to be something that raises and rises to the level of a piston. Right? So, the idea here, then, is even in what is called the Western tradition, there has always been a distinction between a rhetorical generation of a proposition and a non-rhetorical generation of propositions. So actually, what the target of this generative, generative rhetoric is, is not simply, it's not only making the proposition dependent upon rhetorical practices or demonstrating that the proposition comes out of rhetorical practices, but it is also trying to problematize the hierarchical distinction between episteme and doxa. I don't know if you guys know this, but like I find myself reciting actual sentences as I'm explaining this. I like I, it's like just a rut. <laughs> like, here's how I said it, wrote it a thousand times over and over again, or read it a thousand times. Um, and this is, I mean, this is the uh, well, the rhetoric of science. Rhetoric of economics, all of these types of moves are basically attempts to say that thing that you thought was absolute and universal is actually is actually subject to contextual, like historical context. In other words, this thing presents itself as if, as if it comes from nowhere and goes everywhere, but it turns out not so much. This is like the Western conception of myth. There's a moment in which you realize. The work of anthropology comes from somewhere and has certain types of implications. So one recognizes that the seemingly objective world uh, is in fact quite rhetorical, which is not to say subjective. It's very, very important. Opposite of objective is not, well, maybe it's the opposite. I don't give a shit about opposites. Right? Just because something is not objective doesn't make it subjective. It's dialectical thinking at its worst. <laughs> Okay, so does that make sense? So the target of the generative rhetoric then really isn't simply the question of saying there are rhetorical propositions, because that's always been said, but it's saying that this distinction, episteme and doxa, maybe here's a, here's a way of saying it, this is why I call this differentiating, rhetoric is differentiating in, in its attent attentiveness to difference, which I'm trying to show by saying there are different kinds of supplements and there are different kinds of, you know, um, is that this distinction would appear to render a difference, but actually all it does is creates a hierarchy in which this is simply a more universal version of this. In other words, there's an erasure of difference that occurs in this distinction because it is seen as a hierarchy. This one has universality, this one lacks it. This one has contingency, that one lacks it. Right? The same, basically the same thing, but they, they lack universality. So that, that, there's that sense in which uh, um, by rhetoricizing, one is attempting to reintroduce difference into the terrain of thought. Now, one of the things that that means, and one of the implications, is that, for me at least, and I think I italicized this sentence, because everybody 
I don't know. Yeah, 22. Yeah. Okay. The recognition, this is where I say, the recognition that any two practices are somehow rhetorical, rather than indicating a fundamental similarity, should underscore the fact that they are fundamentally different, that they emerge through different practices and produce different effects. So, for instance, a lot of scholars think that by claiming that economics is rhetorical, that you have undone its objectivity, or you've undone its scientific status, and you've now effectively put it on the level of uh, freshman composition classes papers. And it's like, no, what rhetoric should teach, is if, in its emphasis on contingency and context, is that the propositions that emerge out of a freshman class are structurally different than the ones that emerge out of a laboratory. Right? So to say that two things are rhetorical shouldn't indicate a fundamental similarity. Or the only fundamental similarity they share is a mutual subjection to contingency, which is to say nothing. <laughs> which is to say they don't share anything. They, they share that they come out of different places. So to say that practice X is rhetorical is to not, uh, you, to, to claim that economics is rhetorical, I think a lot of people always find like that's the conclusion of their argument. You know, and they spend a lot of time proving that. And I'm always like, well, let's start from that point. Like, X is rhetorical. How? <laughs> right? What are the ways in which it produces its propositions, its truths, its practices, its whatever? Right? So, um, so don't think of X is rhetorical as being an acceptable conclusion, other than 20 years ago. I mean, there is a whole sort of industry of, this, of the rhetoric of X variety. It doesn't matter. You substitute for X biology, it doesn't matter. And it's always, the implicit idea is always, like this thing that seemed to present itself as not being subject to rhetorical, turns out to in fact have been rhetorical. And I'm always like, well, what does that show? Right? I mean, what does that, in? I mean, fine, yes. But I don't think that you've demonstrated anything. Like, you know, sequencing the genome is a different thing than a political speech. <coughs> and that difference, I would fully accept as rhetorical. But I don't know what that means, <laughs> right? Or I don't necessarily understand what the value of simply making that claim uh, is. All right, so what else does the chapter argue? <laughs> that's, the, that's the what are the important elements of rhetoric. A signify contingent differentiate. And then the rest of it is all about this humanism, postmodernism. Right? Okay. It's weird to teach something to you. It's, it's uncomfortable. Like that. That's the first time I've ever like lectured about something that I just assigned. Like all I did was summarize that. I don't know if that's helpful or self-indulgent, <laughs> or maybe both. We would personally like to see you devastate the author. <laughs> all right. Here's <laughs> Here's the dumbass line. No, I, I can tell you my favorite line that still makes me happy when I read it. B. Sicker's reading of Derrida. Where's that one? B. Sicker's reading of Derrida, for instance, is very sophisticated. Unlike a great deal of rhetorical scholarship on Derrida, she gets him right. <laughs> but my readers were both like, how can you say that if you believe in this rhetorical sensibility? And that's one that always boggles my mind. It's like, there are good and bad readings still. <laughs> right? And there's are like, other people's reading of Derrida, this is, uh, I wish I had some read context, it's a great moment in where Derrida's like, how do you get to give up on truth? I mean, who, who really thinks that that's possible? Like, um, yeah, the, the, this, her reading of Derrida is right, and most people in the fields is not. Um, and I don't think that one sacrifices that as a claim by talking about contingency, asignification, you know. You get to just, I mean, who would be the person who could decide to opt out of truth? Like that, would that not be the ultimate God move? I will no longer play the true false game. I will no longer be part of metaphysics. Like, of course you have to, you know. And so I quite like the provocative quality of that sentence because it's not expected. I'm supposed to be one of those guys who doesn't talk about right and wrong. But I do. But only in terms of readings of Derrida. <laughs> uh, any questions about singular rhythms? <laughs> 
So here I'm staging an encounter with, between so-called humanism and so-called postmodernism. So I'm looking at a couple of different instances wherein uh, <coughs> humanists self-proclaim people who are invested in humanism. And what I mean by humanism here is not really well theorized. I'm simply saying that a traditional privilege adhering to the importance of consciousness and reason and agency, subjectivity, like I'm not elaborating a philosophy of humanism. I'm just saying this type of this type of thing. And uh, so folks who are invested in that kind of thing, they see sort of so-called postmodernism come along and they're like, those guys don't care about agency, community, rationality, and um, so you read like Alan Gross's engagement. So what does Alan Gross say? Alan Gross's reading of Foucault and Derrida is to, it, what he does is says, those folks critique intention, the appeal to authorial or subjective intention. But in the end, in order to justify their arguments, they must rely on claims to intention. So ha ha, they're secretly humanists at heart. Right? And so for me, what's instructive about that is not in that encounter with humanism and postmodernism, where a self-proclaimed humanist is reading sort of postmodern thinkers, what happens is not simply that they accentuate their difference, but the humanism reads humanism into postmodernism. Like, this thing is actually the basis for their thing. And so that's this recurring move that, to me, is like, as you read these appropriations, that happens all the time. That's extremely common. You know, it's, and what I, it's what I'm calling this appropriative movement. So that if one were to define humanism less by the content of its propositions and more by the constellation of forces, it seems to be this kind of thing that with whatever it encounters, it appropriates and makes it into a version of itself. That's how it seems to operate. In other words, that's where I say like, on the rhetorical register as we've defined it before, rhetoric responds as constellation of forces, not as signifying content. Right? If you think of it on, on that register, um, humanism is less about the particular claims it makes about agency, subjectivity, consciousness, and more dangerous, in a sense, because of this appropriative movement. Everywhere it goes and finds versions of itself. Right. Yes? Um, isn't there quite a lot of um, instances of the same thing happening in postmodern thought? Um, you didn't read the chapter. <laughs> you just gave it away. Because, yeah, that's the next move, right? <laughs> the next move in the chapter is to say, and postmodernism does the exact same thing. Right? So, so the, fir the first move is to say, like, humanism demonstrates its own constitutive movement of appropriation. And that's where it's like, you know, everyone thinks that the image of the humanist is the Cartesian cogito, the I think, therefore I am, which is just this, like, uh, um, in place static thinking being thing, and that's a problem. And everyone's involved in this critique of, critique of Cartesianism in order to make it more active and dynamic. But I think that Cartesian target is simply wrong. The actual target is the Hegelian consciousness, whose constant, the consciousness is constantly constituted in relation to its own overcoming of others. Right? You always have to go to the next place. You always have to colonize the next world. You always have to, you know, uh, build a strip mall in Red Square. Like you're all, you know, you, that, that it's it is this this the movement of appropriation. What what human was dangerous about humanism? Again, it's not the content of the propositions, but it's the, it's it's appropriative movement. It's appropriative and colonizing movement. That it wants to make everything into a version of itself. In other words, it needs otherness. Otherness is really important to humanism, despite what you may have heard, despite the belief that, like, no, we, we respect otherness, and therefore we are no longer part of that tradition. It's like, no, 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 that's the tradition, right? It needs otherness so that it can overcome that and assimilate it in some capacity. But yes, it's precisely the point. So then I flip, I flip the coin and read Biesecker, addressing postmodernity, which you guys are reading for next time, which, which sees itself and articulates itself as this, like, and you'll, you'll read it. It's, I'm committed to an opening up, a, a strategy of reading that attempts to open up rather than close down. Right? Because I want to create new possibilities. I'm tired of this repetition of the same. I want to create new possibilities. And, and those old discourses, they're not creating any new possibilities. We've got to move past those. Isn't that curious? In other words, I'm interested in opening up. Not like those fuckers. <laughs> 
who are closing everything down. In other words, you're closing down. <laughs> like what she's doing is beginning by saying those things are, we need to be done with those things. And we need to move into the realm of openness. Right? So it's that constitutive paradox. She's doing the same thing. So her open reading strategy begins with closing some things down. Now they're different things, right? They're different things than Alan Gross wants to close down, but nevertheless, they're still closing down and still appropriate. And that's the, se that's the sense in which, like, okay, what one could potentially learn from this, potentially, is that it's not a question of being on Team Nietzsche or Team Plato. <laughs> it's not a question of being on Team Postmodern or Team Humanism. That both of those teams function the same way. And they function that way precisely because they begin to be articulated as positions in relation to one another. And that that happens, that happens instantly, that happens, you know, that's why I say with, with Derrida, or with Biesecker's reading of Derrida is, is good, but whether or not Derrida does, makes his deconstruction into a position, or thought itself, or Biesecker does it, by making it into a position, one puts it into this negative dialectical relationship, and there's no way around that. There's no way to not do that. So I'm saying there's another kind of circle, the critique of metaphysics, the discourse of metaphysics, and the critique of metaphysics. In other words, I'm citing Derrida in this in the move. And everything hinges on how you repeat. That's the difference. The difference is not whether you get outside of the bad thing. Um, or outside of appropriation in this case. Right? So that's where like appropriation is the game, but that doesn't make all appropriation the same. It doesn't mean all appropriation functions the same way. But what it does mean is that nobody gets to have the ethical high ground of non-appropriation. There's no center outside. Right. And so my version of this is singular rhythms. Don't worry about it. Let's get a drink. Hey, uh, questions, thoughts, dreams, hopes? What you really should do, memorize. <laughs> you should really, really, you should put it up in like your mirror. So when you're brushing your teeth, you just read, you just want <laughs> exposed, immersed. I mean, there's Bible's worth of truth in there. <laughs>